Okay, respiratory emergencies. So we're gonna go through things like asthma, our chronic lung disease, like our emphysema, bronchitis, Let's talk about some infections, uh, pneumonia, TB, some respiratory or lung pulmonary trauma issues like our pneumothorax or tension pneumothorax. And then towards the end there, we're gonna talk about some devices um, with the, uh, um, the tension pneumothorax intervention, our chest tubes, our ventilators, et cetera, and intubation as well too. So first thing we'll talk about is asthma. So again, making this exam as less stressful as possible. And we only deal with real legitimate patients in this exam. So this is not the 20 something comes in and says, I have a history of asthma. And you say, when's the last time you used an inhaler? Oh, it's been two years. No, we're talking about the chronic disease state of asthma, usually a pediatric and they're on a maintenance inhaler and a rescue inhaler, okay? So the textbook asthma case, okay? Asthma is a disease of triggers also, by the way. I mentioned migraines were a disease of triggers. Under general medical, we'll talk about sickle cell being a disease of triggers. Asthma also is triggered. And one of the most common triggers is a, a, a respiratory infection. Those viral particles can trigger that hyper-responsiveness of the airways and cause an asthma flare-up, basically. Symptoms of an asthma patient, I, th I think this is a common patient we've all seen and dealt with, the shortness of breath, the tightness, maybe a cough, of course, the wheezing, which they may actually hear themselves that it's wheezing enough. And when we listen to them, that's the lung sound we'll hear. Under medical history, I'm gonna ask, I wanna know a few things about this patient um, in addition to all, everything. Um, if they've ever been intubated before, okay, that's an important thing. That should be on their chart somewhere if they have if they don't tell you. Why? Because that tells me if you got intubated for asthma, either you didn't respond as quickly or as we expected to an exacerbation, or you have a more complex case going on. I wanna watch that patient a bit closer, okay? So like I said in other lectures, in the perfect world, two asthmatics present the triage at the exact same moment, same symptoms, same duration. Let's say they're even twins, okay? And one had to be on a ventilator before, that one gets my last bed. I wanna watch them closer. I'm asking about their medicines, okay? What inhalers are they using at home? How often are they using them? Are they checking things like peak flows and such at home? Do they have a lot of pediatrics working with their pediatrician or an asthma doctor, an allergy asthma doctor, have a management plan they can use at home that when their peak flows start to show some changes, they can start to do some things or adjust their dosages if need be. So I'm gonna ask them about their asthma care at home. The physical exam is gonna reveal some of this respiratory distress, breathing harder, increased work of breathing. Um, again, in peds, your number one cause of, of bradycardia is an oxygenation problem. So if they're having problems oxygenating and ventilating, we might see bradycardia in these kids. And they're gonna have an increased expiratory phase. Asthma is a problem getting the air out past the bronchoconstriction, not getting the air in, but getting it out. So they're gonna be working harder on the exhalation phase. Your normal, and you'll hear this again when we talk about the ventilators, your normal I to E, letter I to E, that means your inspiration to exhalation time is about one to two. So with these outflow problems, you start to see that exhalation time become longer. You have to work harder to get it out. And that's why the wheezing shows up first on exhalation because it's an outflow problem. Now, if they continue to clamp down more and more, you may get wheezing on both inhalation and exhalation, and then eventually get nothing as they're moving so little air, it's not enough to even make the wheezing sound. So of course, a chest X-ray, maybe some lab tests, depending on whatever, but I wanna bring out the peak flow meter as one of their diagnostics. <clears throat> we don't use these as much as we probably should. I know some places they do try to use them um, often, and some places you got very, aggressive respiratory therapy that just brings the peak flows regardless and just kind of autonomously does it uh, to help get some measurements. But a peak flow is the most objective measurement of their response to therapy or their current capacity. And it puts a number to it. And that's what's useful because the patient may not be able to say if they feel like they're really getting better or not. But if you get a number, you can actually see if they're improving or not, or maybe they're declining still. You don't need to know anything for the CEN about the numbers, the predicted values, what's good, what's bad. Just know that the peak flow device 
is the most objective way to assess them. All right. Supplemental oxygen, if needed, um, and, you know, if they're keeping their SATs above that 93, 94 range, they probably don't need it. Um, of course, we got our monitors, our pulse ox. Usually, the pulse ox. You know, this is not really an oxygen problem; it's an outflow problem, right? So usually they're auctioning pretty well. And then let them get in whatever position maximizes <clears throat> their work of breathing. You're gonna see these medicines many times throughout this next respiratory section because they're used for a lot of these respiratory problems. So we're not gonna to have to redefine them every time. So the first time they come up, we'll talk about them a little bit more. So our bronchodilators specifically are beta-2 agonists. So where were those beta-2 cells? We have beta one on the one heart. We have beta twos on the two lungs. All right, these are supposed to target the beta twos most specifically. And what does an agonist do? It stimulates. So when you stimulate a beta two receptor, it bronchodilates it. Okay, it seems kind of opposite what you, th you think. If you stimulate the beta two, you think it causes constriction, right? But actually, when you stimulate it, it causes it to dilate and relax. All right, provenal, albuterol. It, there, we even got ProAir, if you use a brand name, okay? Um, Zopinex, we'll, we'll put that in here as well too. I'll tell you this, the, the CE in exam makes no discernment between Zopinex and your other standard beta twos. Um, I know certain providers prefer the Zopinex. What do we know about it? It's a little more, well, let's look at why the beta two, why do we see the heart rate change? These are beta two agonists. So they, they should go mostly to the beta two cells and lungs, but sometimes you get a little spillover to the beta one on the heart, okay? And if you stimulate your beta ones, you increase your heart rate. So even though the beta twos aren't designed to go there, they're kind of close enough, they're kind of like cousins, that there's times the beta one receptors may pick up on them and you get that heart rate stimulation. So the Zopinex, you don't see this all the time with Zopinex, but it's designed and the evidence shows that it's less likely to trigger that beta one stimulant effect. It can still happen, but it's less, that's the only real difference. There's a little timing difference. Like you only do Zopinex, I think every six hours, um, a little dosage change. But for this exam, they're all beta two agonists. They're all bronchodilators. Now, Epi would be your prototype. That's your granddaddy beta two agonist. Okay, now, epi is not beta-2 selective, of course. Epi is going to affect the beta-1s for sure, right? Uh, it's also going to affect your alpha receptors with your blood pressure going up, okay? But if they're in status, which means lockdown, they're looking hypoxic, cyanotic, they're fixing the need to be rsi We give epi, and we're, talk and we're not talking nebulized, we're talking IV, okay? Because they're also going to be having some cardiopulmonary issues at this point, too. Remember that bradycardia, okay? So IV epi for status. It will work on both the lungs and it will work on the heart. So these are our first line drugs. You can add, I, I probably should move the atrovent up there also because we do frequently co-administer that. We're not given the atrovent, which is an anticholinergic, to dry them up. The anticholinergic effect we're looking for is it's not, it doesn't affect the beta twos to get the bronchodilation. It affects some of those muscarinic receptors that control the muscles of the lower airways and it helps to relax them, okay? So most of us will do the, what we call duo nebs, or A and A, albedo and atrovent, or however you wanna call it. Um, if you had to pick only one, <clears throat> or the first one, you go with the beta two agonist. It has the most profound effect. By adding the atrovent to this, you get a little more of a response as well. But the beta two agonist is the minimal we're gonna give that patient. So you may, and that's fine to pick both um, as far as a first line treatment. Mag sulfate, um, we're gonna leave that as a second or third line intervention, so it will not be the first thing you go for. Some providers, it's even a third or a fourth line intervention. Um, personal practice, typically I'm gonna try like three nebulizers, and then if I'm still not making improvement, then I add the mag. As you know, mag is not gonna be the thing that saves them from death, okay? So it's not really our emergency rescue medicine, it's an adjunct we might add in as part of the the treatment pathway if they're not responding. And again, like other meds, you don't need to worry about any dosages, any rates or frequencies. Just know it's not the first line thing we're going to. Because we're talking about asthma, and asthma is an inflammatory condition, steroids need to be part of this. I'm pretty sure most of you guys already know this. And know what the steroids are doing. 
they're not, again, they're not going to save the patient from death right away. But because the onset is so delayed, they do need to be part of at least that second round of med administration. The first ones get the NEB going. And then you start getting the other things like the steroids, okay? Whether it's IV or PO, it does not matter. You're not giving it for today. You're giving it for the next 8, 12, 20, 24 hours. One of the metrics that has been tested for not only to suppress the inflammation is also to prevent rebound. And if you look at some of the data and some of the articles they did, they actually studied giving certain doses of steroids to an asthma patient. What's the rate of readmission? Okay. So you're really giving it for down the road, but we want to get it in. It's like the Lasix for our CHF patient. It's not going, Lasix doesn't save them from the clutches of death, right? But it does work on that preload. It does work on that fluid. So much evidence-based that we do need to give as one of our first line or second line interventions to start it working as soon as it can. Uh, antibiotics, if indicated, anxiolytics, mm, what's up with that? Well, not a first line thing, but think about this. If you're struggling to breathe, okay, that's very anxiety producing. You may not be taking the full effect of that nebulizer or that inhaled medicine. So if we do usually, have, and this is not like a first line thing, maybe a third or fourth, maybe I've done three treatments. I might consider giving them a taste, a touch, a very small dose of a benzo just to take the edge off because what's my concern with benzos is the opposite, is respiratory depression. I don't need that, okay? So a very judgment call, but definitely not a first or second line thing, maybe down there around fourth or fifth line uh, option, depending on your provider. So we're gonna treat this patient, peak flows are getting better, no more serious underlying cause going on. I apologize, apparently it's uh, HOA lawn day, so we might have a lawnmower here in the background for a little bit. Um, we got some opportunities to teach them about using their inhalers. So it's good to ask them, you know, maybe it's a good chance to have them show us how you're using the inhaler. There might be a reason why it's not working that well if they're not using it correctly. You know, do they have a spacer? Spacers have been shown to increase the medicine distribution. <clears throat> there are some pictures on the internet. I used to have one in the class that actually, they took um, like an aerosol, an MDI, an aerosol inhaler, and put like a tracer in it and took a special x-ray to see where the particles go when they hit. And if they don't use a spacer, about a third of that medicine just hits the back of the throat and goes nowhere. So you're losing two thirds of the dose. You put a spacer between the inhaler and the mouth, and for that brief moment, it holds that medicine, and the patient is actually breathing the medicine in by negative pressure. Think about it. The pump is pushing positive pressure. To get a better dispersion, you want to actually suck that medicine in by negative inhalation, and you're pulling it down past the posterior foot. You're pulling it into the lungs. That's what that spacer does. It makes it more likely to distribute better. So we'd like to see them use those if possible. Hmm. Okay, acute bronchitis. So we're talking about the chest cold here. Acute meaning just the one-time isolated case, not the chronic. We'll talk about chronic bronchitis too in a bit. So this is also an outflow problem. The outflow issue here is there's mucus being produced because of a response probably to a viral particle in the airways, so a chest cold. Now, this graph also shows that the airway is a little narrowed with a little bronchoconstriction. That's kind of like a reactive bronchoconstriction. So we've got both that plus the mucus making the airway diameter smaller. Again, still, it's not a problem getting the air in, it's a problem getting the air out, okay? Most of these are actually outflow problems. Okay, so mucus and constriction, usually due to a virus or a recent upper respiratory issue. Their presenting symptom for bronchitis is not always shortness of breath, tightness. A lot of times it's that cough, trying to mobilize or get that mucus out or to deal with it. And sometimes they actually sign in with chest pain, why? they've been coughing so hard for the last five, seven days, their accessory muscles are getting wore out. They're starting to splint, having spasms, and it hurts. So there's one of your other chest pain things. What, what else is going on with it? Are you having a cough with this kind of thing? So with this extra work of getting the air out past that mucus, you might see the accessory muscles, that increased work of breathing, again, that prolonged exhalation, okay? And working harder to get that air out. Now, if it's the chronic bronchitis patient, 
that's, we mentioned this yesterday in a cardiac, that right side heart strain, you know, they've got chronic bronchitis every day for 30 years from frequent smoking, that right side of the heart is pushing harder against that pulmonary hypertension. And that's where we had a conversation yesterday about like the whole preload thing with the right side of heart failure, core pulmonale. Ronchi is the lung sound. That's that loose, rattly phlegm that they're trying to cough out. So asthma was wheezing, bronchitis was ronchi. And sometimes if you're not really sure what you're hearing and you hear this loose stuff, take your stethoscope away, tell them to cover their mouth and cough hard one time. A lot of times with ronchi, that sound will suddenly go, not always completely away, but it'll greatly diminish. And that'll help kind of cool and that's what you were hearing. Same medicines here as far as your first line is the bronchodilators, albuterol, provenol, whatever. We talked about the Zopinex and use also. And there's the atrovent also. Um, steroids, I'm gonna say plus or minus. If between bronchitis and asthma, if you have one dose of steroids left, who gets it? The asthma patient. Asthma is definitively an inflammatory process, chronic asthma, an inflammatory process. Bronchitis, well, it does have some of that inflammation in the airways, like in the picture. It's kind of a provider call whether you're gonna do it or not. It's not as absolute. It would not hurt. You're still gonna give the bronchodilators first. Still gonna do that first. And you may even treat their cough before you consider steroids because that's what they came in for was this cough with all this mucus. So steroids are not wrong, but they're just not the most likely first line thing for this patient. And this is pretty standard for most of the people we treat. You know, did we make them better? Is there anything more serious going on? Are there any barriers to their follow-up care, things like that? Do we need to admit them? What are the risk factors, et cetera? Now, bronchiolitis, so back to pediatrics for a minute. This is the lower airways, and this is an inflammatory response to the RSV. Okay, so again, here's a viral trigger. The thing is, sometimes bronchiolitis gets confused with asthma because it presents similarly. They've got an upper... They've got a respiratory infection, and that's one of your triggers for asthma. The lung sound is the same. We hear wheezing with bronchiolitis and asthma. Okay, so we kind of might, it might look like asthma. But what I don't want to do is label this child as an asthmatic. Asthma on a medical record connotates a chronic disease. Bronchiolitis is not. Bronchiolitis is a one-time, basically an inflammatory response to the RSV specifically. An asthma patient... <clears throat> And the more we understand and gain knowledge about asthma over the years, chronic asthma is thought to be a hypersensitivity of the lung tissue. Think of it as like an allergic reaction of the lungs. And the people with asthma actually have some tissue differences as far as how they respond to irritants. They've got like a, a chronic abnormality of their tissue. They're over-responsive. That's why you see a lot of these asthma and allergy practices, because there's a lot of overlapping care between true asthma and allergies. So think of asthma as allergies of the airways, chronic. Bronchiolitis is just a temporary one-time reaction to the RSV. There should be nothing intrinsically wrong with this child's lung surface. It should be otherwise normal. They're just having an expected reaction to the RSV in their airways. Okay. Most RSV bronchiolitis will be under two years old, and a lot of that will be under one year old even. Okay. And what we, we want to make sure it's bronchiolitis because we don't want to label them chronically as an as a intrinsic lung problem. They'll stick with them for a long time. Okay. One of the issues with bronchiolitis that makes it um, a little more concerning is it's going to affect younger kids, again, usually under two, um, and a lot of infants. And if you're having to work hard to breathe with bronchiolitis. Breastfeeding or bottle feeding is not the preferred thing that child wants to do. So they can actually present somewhat dehydrated and not that they're, not that they're malnourished, but you know, the last week or so they've been sick, they're not getting the calories they need to help fight, deal with infection, compensate, things like that. Probably fussy all the time. The other thing about bronchiolitis is the kids who are more at risk for it are ones that have some congenital birth issues like your preemies, your preterm kids, ones that had any other cardio or pulmonary issues from birth. They're, they compromise a higher percentage of your bronchiolitis kids. 
And then yet, I'm gonna give you a third thing that makes bronchiolitis important. As it affects these younger kids, under one or under two, what happens when you breathe faster? You lose more moisture through your lung tissue, okay? So there's fluid loss issues. Kids, babies, infants, bigger surface area to mass ratio. So there's more opportunities for these sweats and these chills to lose fluid that way. So fluid loss is a big issue for bronchiolitis or the potential for it. So there's a couple risks there. The poor, the poor eating or drinking, possibly they have some congenital issues that put them at risk and the risk for the fluid uh, imbalance. Sometimes those reasons alone, even if the kid looks pretty good otherwise, those reasons alone are enough to put the kid in. Even if it's just for IV fluids or humidified oxygen. So you'll see the work of breathing. <clears throat> Prior to that fever, again, you're still having that viral response from the RSV and the wheezing is the lung sound. Accessory muscles. Under one year old, kids want to breathe through their nose. If you see a kid under one breathing through their mouth, that should concern you because that is not their preferred way to breathe. They're gonna flare their nostrils first to make their airway bigger and get more air through their nose. They're going to use their accessory muscles, of the, even their chest wall muscles. They're gonna do these things before they open their mouth to breathe. So by the time they're mouth breathing, you should be like, hmm, I missed something. They've been struggling for a while. So nasal flaring is the first accessory muscle. So we need to test this RSV because we want to know that it's an, basically an RSV response and not an asthma patient, okay? So I want to see them be RSV positive. It sounds mean, right? It's not mean. I just don't want to mislabel them, all right? So we need a test for this. So there's many different ways to do this. Um, and this, the ENA knows this, so they're not gonna ask you how to do it. Like, what do you use? Do you do the washings? Do you do the aspiration? Do you do this? That doesn't matter. The fact is, where will you do it? That's the universal thing, all right? And the universal thing is you're gonna do it from the nasopharynx, okay? Nasopharynx, either washings or swab. If you have only one humidifier left, now I don't mean like a vaporizer that you put, I'm talking about the little water bottle that goes onto the Christmas, tree, the oxygen Christmas tree or the air Christmas tree. Um, when you got them doing a breathing treatment or if they're on a nasal cannula, there's only one humidifier bottle left in the hospital and you've got a kid with bronchiolitis, you go put it on them because that risk for that fluid imbalance with them bringing that up, breathing at a much faster rate when they're trying to fight this respiratory insult. You can put humidified oxygen on anybody, but at least do it for the RSV kid, the bronchiolitis one. And you're going to see the similar medicines here, the beta twos, the anticholinergics, the duo neb, when you combine those, try and get that bronchodilation there. Typically antibiotics, not anymore. We used to prophylax a lot of these kids uh, with clafrin was one of the common ones uh, with our concern that maybe a possible secondary pneumonia might show up. Okay, that's kind of fallen out of practice. I'm gonna say if there are risk factors or something that's concurrent, then yeah, they might do that. But it used to be like we did it for all these kids. We're now doing it on a case by case, only if indicated basis. Um, steroids, um, currently the, look at something here, yeah. Yeah, there's no evidence that says steroids make them better. Maybe it prevents rebound stuff, that's, but that's a different statement. Okay, so again, steroids are on a case by case basis. Your ENPC currently says um, the ENA class on pediatrics does not even recommend them for bronchiolitis. It feels there's no role for them. But even then, it's not even a first line thing, so it's not going to be on our exam. Okay, the only one where steroids are first line is asthma. All right, do they need to be admitted? Well, of course, if they're still having oxygen problems, they do. Okay. But even if we fix their oxygenation, <clears throat> they're looking better, um, parents are feeling good. If we pick up on those other risk factors, like the risk for fluid imbalance, dehydrate, maybe they need to come in just overnight for some IV fluids, more, more humidified breathing treatments, things like that. Remember, the nebulizers that some of these parents have at home, they don't have the same humidity that we can add to them in the hospital. They're just basically the dry room air being run through a compressor to do the nebulizer. There's really no humidity in those. Okay, and I kind of I feel like they're kind of drying sometimes as I kind of see these things. 
So this may be the whole thing that the kid needs to come in for fluids too, at least to be monitored for one night. Depends on your hospital, depends where you work, depends on your pediatricians and how they feel. If they do go home, we're definitely gonna to have to reinforce these parents about treating fevers, because fevers is more risk for fluid loss as a kid sweats. We need to talk to them about, you know, even though the kids fuss, you've got to encourage them to drink, get some fluids because that risk for the fluids again. And if we do send bronchiolitis home, this one definitely needs a follow-up because of all the risk factors we just discussed, okay? A lot, if, it's, if it's daytime, a lot of good ER attendings, if they're treating bronchiolitis, they're reaching out to the pediatric office and saying, hey, I got your kid here, looking good, RSV positive, responded well to what I'm doing. They've got access to X, Y, and Z. Can you see them in the next 24, 48 hours? And they're going to work them in because the pediatricians get it. They know that bronchiolitis, the risk for fluid uh, issues, dehydration, the feedings, the caloric intake, they get it. They'll usually work them in. Um, COPD. Now, when we start talking about the, the chronic ones that the adults have, like the, um, the emphysema and the chronic bronchitis, we kind of use some of these words interchangeably because technically these are both chronic outflow or obstructive diseases, whether it be emphysema, they can't get the air out from the alveolar damage, or bronchitis, where they have bronchitis every day and they can't get it, the air out from the mucus. Okay, so technically COPD is a group of diseases, although most times you say COPD, you immediately go right to emphysema and think of that. So they do share a lot of characteristics, but there is actually a difference in the pathology between them, even though we treat them the same. The end result, because they're both obstructive, is we get air trapping, and that trapped air is carbon dioxide because the air goes in and it exchanges for oxygen but we can't get the CO2 out. So you get this air trapping and this hypercapnia going on, right? This is a very typical or classic COPD x-ray. And what you see here <clears throat> is a lot of black. Now I don't mean black like a pneumothorax because there is actually still lung tissue here. So you can see the haziness, but the, the black is air. Now I don't mean like there's nothing there. I think I just said that. Well, I mean, when the x-ray goes through the person when the, radi when the radiation beam goes through the person and it hits the plate, the image behind it, what you see, for example, when I look right here, what I'm seeing is a lot of black space because what that x-ray went through was a lot of air. What was that air? That was those distended alveoli that were larger than they should be holding that trapped gas in there, okay? Yes, this, this x-ray beam that went through here still went through skin, muscle, fatty tissue, maybe rib tissue, you know, intercostal muscles, the lung, and then through the back. But what it saw mostly was trapped air. All right, so COPD x-rays have a, a lot of this dark black area. All right, we call that hyperinflated. Look at the diaphragm, how flat that is from years of working harder to breathe. Look at the overall shape here. Looks almost like a square. And look at the ribs. The ribs should curve down a lot more, but using all those accessory muscles over the years, those ribs start to straighten out and becoming more horizontal. All right, very typical COPD x-ray. And then on lateral views, you see a lot of the same characteristics. A lot of black spaces here. Again, that's a lot of trapped air, those CO2 retainers, flat diaphragm. The nice top of the lung here starting to flatten out. It should have a nice peak to it. It almost becomes a barrel. Okay, look at the amount of, I'm gonna point this out too. Look at the amount of body fat on this person. This is pretty typical for chronic COPD also. Like, can you say that chronic, that'd be chronic, chronic, but you get my point. Um, these people burn more energy, working harder to breathe. These people are somewhat nutritional de deficient a lot of times because again, the preferred work of breathing over eating. If they do eat, sometimes it's like they eat like a bird. You know, you don't want to fill up your belly with a, a decent, balanced, full adult-sized meal because that presses on your lungs, on your diaphragm. So if that's an important thing for COPD people is nutritional counseling, not in the ER, but as far as part of their chronic disease management, because they do tend to be uh, have some nutritional issues also. So the chronic bronchitis uh, is that mucus, not just during the chest cold, but they have it every day, 365 for years always working harder to get that air out past it. So there's a chronic irritant causing this mucus. What is that? It's probably smoking. 
that chronic daily exposure causing basically a reaction, not an allergic reaction, but just an irritated reaction. And what does your body do when something irritates it? Secretes mucus. So in the lungs, that's gonna be that phlegm that comes up. Let's talk about COPD patients and <clears throat> oxygen, the respiratory drive. So this really is a moot point and it's really more of a um, sacred cow. What is a sacred cow? A sacred cow in medicine or nursing is something that we, we've just kind of entrenched to believe something and it's really not evidence-based. So what's the sacred cow here? What's the statement? Oh, I'm worried about giving a COPD patient oxygen. It may make them stop breathing. So let's look at that. So the normal healthy pulmonary system <clears throat> in conjunction with your CNS, its desire to breathe is based upon your CO2 level. When your CO2 level goes up, your body says, hey dude, take a breath, get rid of that CO2. And by doing that, you get oxygen in your lungs. When you are Mr. or Miss COPD and you're trapping that air all the time and your normal CO2 level goes from you know 45, to 47, to 50, 55, and you're walking around every day with a CO2 of 55, 56, 57, your body starts to get numb to that level. It says, you don't need to breathe. You trap CO2 all the time, you're fine. You're not even hypoxic. And then you do start getting hypoxic and your brain says, whoa, wait a minute. We, for, we got stupid about breathing by CO2, but you are hypoxic, you better definitely take a breath now. So it changes that O2 drive. So when your COPD patient is in distress, having an exacerbation, okay, the thought process is, the failed logic is don't give them oxygen. Their brain's gonna say they have enough and stop breathing. So I'll first tell you, and this is true amongst any lecture, author, presentation I've gone to, in service, whatever, everybody will tell you, if someone stopped breathing on oxygen, because they're COPD patients, they were going to stop breathing anyways. Your administrative oxygen did not kill them. Because the bigger crime actually is if you withhold what they need, and remember they are hypoxic. Now, this is where that safety guideline is, um, that we don't need to nuke them and get them to 100%. We only need to keep them somewhere in the low 90s. Okay, and again, and maybe ask them what their baseline is, especially if they're checking their pulse ox at home. If their baseline is a 91 on a good day, you know, I, that's all I need, all right? So what's the take home to this? Even though it's not a real realistic thing that's gonna happen, we will give them oxygen if clinically indicated. If they're struggling to breathe, they've got that, that guppy look in their eyes, that 10,000 mile stare. They're not as responsive as they should be. They're looking cyanotic, yes, 100% non-rebreather, but watch them closely. As soon as they start kind of becoming more alert, interactive, um, things like that, t start titrating that down very quickly. So rapidly go from that non-rebreather to a simple face mask, start working it down from 10 liters to eight to six, nasal, maybe a Vinny mask in there somewhere, nasal cannula, four, two, do it very quickly. It's easier to take away in this case than it is to, tr to try to keep adding on when actually they're gonna fail and go on a ventilator anyways, okay? So that's, that discussion. All right. We talked about the core pulmonary. That's the right side of heart failure. Common underlying etiology is people with pulmonary hypertension. And of that, a lot of those are people with chronic lung disease. Again, the right side of the heart, trying to push that blood to the lungs. It can't get there. Too much pulmonary artery pressure because the lungs are diseased, causes that back pressure on the right ventricle. It starts to fail and their fluid backs up not to the lungs, but to everywhere else. And we defined anasarca yesterday, which was that edema everywhere. Okay, not ascites. Ascites is due to an albumin problem in, in our liver failure. We'll talk about that under um, liver disease later. Um, but this is fluid third spacing basically from the venous system all over. All right, the pathology under the um, emphysema, this is, the alveoli are alveoli. <laughs> the alveoli are damaged from years, most likely exposed to smoking, and they lose their stretch. They're they're no longer nice and elastic, and they don't have that recoil. Okay, remember Starling's law yesterday. We talked about the chambers of the heart. Anything that can stretch has a good ejection. They've lost the stretch of their alveoli, so the alveoli stay over distended. 
so they don't have that extra little bit of oomph to help get the air out. They can get it in. They have to work to get it out. Think of it this way. Um, if your patient, if a trauma patient, if, if a patient dies um, and you give them that last breath with the Ambu bag, okay, just, and they just died, is that air going to stay in their lungs or come out? It's going to come out because you've got that recoil, not just of the chest wall expanding, but their alveoli, you've just distended them with the Ambu bag. And now in a healthy lung, it recoils back out. Emphysema patient doesn't have this. So they have to work harder to get that air out. You're going to see that increase. Uh, work of breathing on the exhalation phase. Again, trying to push the air out, okay? Of all your chronic lung disease patients, if all you knew was that they were on oxygen, you could assume it's probably emphysema patient. Statistically, they're the more likely one that is actually developed hypoxia, okay? Yes, some chronic bronchitis go on it, but oxygen typically is with the, with the emphysema patient. So they're gonna find their position of comfort. Don't force them to lay down, lay flat in the stretcher. If they wanna sit up, let them. Matter of fact, they may even swat you away and say, no, I'm sitting up. If they wanna stay in that rigid chair, you know, the, the little chair in the room, like for the family members, cause it's more rigid, they can sit straight up, let them, okay? Get their work of breathing better. Then we can say, okay, let's get you on the stretcher and recline you a little bit, position of comfort. Pursed lip breathing, we might see that. That is where they're like blowing out a candle, just that. Why are they doing that? By blowing against the pursed lips, they're exerting some back pressure into their alveoli. What is that doing? That, is, that helps keep the alveoli distended or expanded. And what they're, what they're hoping to get is a little bit of that recoil. Like go back to the heart. When we had the right ventricle MI, that right ventricle was infarcting. It couldn't stretch as much. It couldn't get the fluid to the lungs. How do we treat that problem? We gave them some fluid boluses to help stretch it artificially with some IV fluid. This person's lungs is doing the same thing with that pursed lip breathing. They're trying to stretch their alveoli a little bit to help regain some of that recoil that they've lost. And this is just something they learn to do over a year. They don't say, oh, I'm gonna start pursed lip breathing today. They just notice that it eases their sin and it becomes a habit and they do it all the time there. So positioning um, for the CEN, CPAP, BiPAP, all you need to know about those is it's an intermediate step between supplemental oxygen and intubation. There's like a whole gray zone. At, at what point, what criteria do I start CPAP? At what point do I start BiPAP? Don't worry about the settings, none of that. Just know it's in, we don't start them on this first. We do supplemental first. If they're really not responding, they're kind of failing, then we go to one of these intermediate steps. And of course, if that's not working, then they go on the ventilator. That's all you need to know for the exam, okay? All right, so medicines, similar ones here again. As far as the inhaled beta twos and the uh, atrovent. If we're dealing with the bronchitis patient, we need to address the mucus at some point. A general rule of thumb is if their cough is productive, Let's keep this, make it more efficient. Let's, let's, let's enhance that process of moving that mucus. So an expectorant for that, okay? If their cough is non-productive, I mean, it's just that dry, it's wearing them out, it's giving them the chest pain, it's hurting, okay? That's where I want a suppressant, okay? It's like the Tesselon, uh, maybe some of some codeine in it, but we're gonna be careful of that because I don't wanna suppress their respiratory drive either. So chronic bronchitis and acute bronchitis, we're gonna support that mucus production or the lack of. And then we have to decide, is it safe to send this patient home or not? So we probably had to put them on some supplemental oxygen. I, I need to make sure I can wean them off and maintain a baseline. Now, <clears throat> weaning them off the oxygen or back to their normal level, if they're already on home oxygen, think about their activity at home. If because if you just wean them off while they're on the stretcher, but they get up to go to the patient restroom and they suddenly desat, that might be a reason to have to keep them. You know, because if you send them home, they're probably not going to sit in the recliner in front of the TV 24 seven. They probably get to the bathroom, up to the dining room table, up to the kitchen, outside to smoke, things like that. So wean them off at the bedside and then maybe do a little exertion, maybe walk with a pulse ox just in the room or out in the hallway or something. That may be what buys them the ticket to have to get admitted. 
okay? Um, if they do not normally use oxygen, and now they do, I mean, we can't wean them off. It's not that an ER doctor can't write for oxygen. They can, they're a doctor, they can do whatever they want. Does that really tell you that patient's been stabilized? If they now suddenly require oxygen, you can't wean them off. No, they have not been stabilized. They, it's like we talked under dementia. You know, granddad comes in, he's not any psych medicines. We had to give him some geodon. You know, can he go home with 20 of geodon twice? No, we don't know. You know, that's a new thing for him. It needs to be adjusted under a controlled setting. So that's one reason why, you know, because a lot of times we say that, well, no, the ER doctor isn't right, Frog. They can if they want but it does not indicate the patient's been stabilized or had their, their needs addressed there. So to tie it all together here for these chronic lung disease patients, again, remember that picture I showed you, the, the lack of body fat, we want to encourage them to eat. All right, hey, go eat all the cake and ice cream you want, you know, as long as it's that skinny person. <laughs> you need calories, okay? Get as much calories bang for your buck that you can. Uh, home oxygen safety, okay? We know a lot of them probably still smoke, all right? It's one thing to take the nasal cannula off and park it on the forehead. Take it off and step away from it, okay? There's, there's videos online. There's, there's actually, pub, uh, I've seen two public safety ones done by fire departments showing with a mannequin and a nasal cannula and a cigarette how it can light their face on fire, okay? Not cool. I don't like burn patients. I don't want you coming back as a burn patient. Take it off. I know you're not going to quit. Take it off. Step away from it. Um, exercise. <clears throat> There's actually pulmonary rehab clinics for these patients. It has been shown, even though they don't have a lot of work capacity, if you can stress them enough to recruit more alveoli, at least to maintain some function, that can actually prolong a quality of life. Now, it's not an ER thing, but you know, if you get into a discussion with some of these patients, you know, about other things you might suggest for their care, let's face it, they may say they have the best doctor in the world. But if it's just a primary care guy, they may not think of these things. You know, even some pulmonologists don't. So some other opportunities to improve their quality, minimize their disease process. I'm going to talk about pneumonia right quick, and then we'll um, go to lunch slash dinner. <clears throat> All right, so when we talk about pneumonia, without anything being said, as far as an emergency, we're talking about bacterial pneumonia, specifically streptococcal pneumonia. Strep pneumonia is the one that all your core measures, your joint commission stuff, your CMS stuff, if they ever talk about pneumonia tracking or surveillance, it's strep pneumonia. Strep pneumonia has um, a high incidence of hospitalization, complications, and mortality associated with it. Viral pneumonias, that's like the walking pneumonia, meaning you get to walk out of here and go home. A lot of us have had a viral pneumonia. We felt really bad, horrible, we're sick, but we did okay. It doesn't have the same degree of complications, all right? But strep pneumonia is what we're talking about unless we specify otherwise. Now, the presentation for both is similar. It's a lung infection. So you're gonna have fevers, chills, you're gonna have cough, probably some mucus coming up, tightness in the chest, maybe some chest pain from the coughing, things like that. Lung sounds could kind of be anything. It just depends, is it really more of a wet kind of process? Is it a little more dry with some thick, tenacious phlegm down in there? Um, crackles, I, I always have a hard time telling crackles versus rails or rowels, um, but you're gonna have some abnormal lung sound there. <clears throat> Chest x-ray is your test of choice. Now, one of the problems with pneumonia is it does not always show up clearly on the first x-ray because remember humidity, moisture loss through the lung tissue. And if that person has been having increased work of breathing and breathing faster last couple days, that lung tissue may be kind of dry. And so therefore it doesn't show up as well on the chest x-ray. Sometimes you'll hear the attending or the hospitalist say, um, it's not showing up very well now, but we'll admit them. And the next morning's x-ray will kind of fluff out the pneumonia. I like that fluff out. Because a lot of times giving them some IV fluids to deal with the dehydration or the fluid loss causes that moisture to enhance and lung and it shows up better on x-ray. So sometimes it's not always clear cut in the first x-ray. <clears throat> We're still gonna do our respiratory interventions for them, our monitors, our pulse ox, et cetera. One of the big things with this is that early antibiotics, you know, we all have our pneumonia Nazi that pulls our charts and reviews them, make sure we're hitting those core measures, right? 
So early antibiotics have been proven to make a difference. Um, and actually, this is interesting. It's actually only tracked in the ones that you admit. If you do discharge um, a community-acquired pneumonia home, even if it's bacterial with antibiotics, those ones aren't tracked. It's the hospitalized ones that they look at. So if you miss that four-hour window, what do you do? You tell them to sign out and sign back in. No, just joking. Um, of course, the inhaled medicines also, the albuterol, the atrovent, and then stuff for fever. So there's a pneumonia x-ray for you. Um, now this one is fluffing out really well. You can clearly see these infiltrates here. This is a middle lobe pneumonia, right? <clears throat> if you knew nothing else about this patient, if, like if you're the radiologist, okay, um, you would lean towards this being a pneumonia because it's the middle lobe and pneumonia prefers middle and or lower lobes. TB prefers upper lobes. So if that's all the information you have, middle lobe infiltrate, you say probably pneumonia. If they say upper lobe infiltrate, you say probably TB until I get more information. All right, so we'll do lunch. Hold on. Okay, so back under the respiratory, our, our next topic here is hyperventilation. And this, of course, is when a patient's breathing too fast. Now, we'll talk more about this under the ABGs as far as whether it's the primary problem or it's a compensation for something. Um, but in this case, we're talking about it's the primary problem. The person actually checks in, they're hyperventilating, they've probably got some anxiety issues going on, some stress, some drama in their lives, things like that. However, and, and even though a lot of times we can pick up on these like right away, you can like look at them, you know what the deal is, right? But we also wanna make sure that they're not actually compensating for something else. Because for example, if they're actually in some metabolic acidosis, the compensation for that is hyperventilation or that aspirin overdose, again, metabolic acidosis, the hyperventilation may be the compensation. But we're gonna talk about this from the perspective where it is the primary problem. So probably some anxiety going on, right? So the person, they feel like they can't breathe. They may say, I, I can't breathe, right? You know, they can, okay? They're just breathing too fast. They need to slow that down, okay? And they could be, you know, over dramatic with this, you know, feel like they're going to pass out, they're dizzy. There's actually a reason for this, not because they're hypoxic, but because when we, when we do the blood gases and we talk about what does alkalosis cause, it does cause a change in neuro, uh, neuro, neurological functioning. And that's why they get some of the symptoms they do, the tingling in their feet, the tingling around their face, um, maybe the cramping or the spasms of their hands and feet. Now, looking at the medical history, some things I don't wanna see, I don't wanna see they have a cardiac history. I, you know, I don't wanna see that they're diabetic because they're diabetic and hyperventilating. I'm like, okay, next thing is check a blood sugar because they could be in DKA. You know, I like to see they have a panic disorder. That kind of reassures me that that's their primary problem. You know, and I don't want to see like under medicines that they're taking, you know, a bunch of stimulant-based medicines or they're, you know, they're taking the, uh, let's see, they're probably not taking the aspirin four times a day, getting aspirin toxic, but maybe they're telling me, oh man, I take these goodies powders or um, what's the other one? Not goodies powders, but stand back, I think is one of them. And there's another one out there. But, you know, these headache powders that you buy, you know, at the convenience store, and a lot of people use stuff like this, and they don't realize that there's a large dose of aspirin in those things, and you can actually accidentally overdose yourself. So, at the end of the day, I hope their medical history is clear of these things. You know, if they tell me they've got this anxiety condition, that reassures me that it's probably their problem, and they could look pretty anxious and stressed out, right? Just their life. BC powder, thank you. BC powders and goodies. Yeah, a lot of, and I think it's a guy thing. They tend to take them a lot and they don't realize what's in them and they can actually cause some issues. Maybe they wonder why they're having all that gastritis or ulcers all the time from all that aspirin, right? There's your word for the cramping of the hands and the feet, carpopedal spasms. If you've ever seen this, it's almost kind of comical the way their hands will kind of like draw up and it'll freak them out even more, which just compounds the entire problem because their hands are cramping, right? So what are we gonna do for this person? We need to slow them down, right? Remember, we've already ruled out that there's not a medical issue going on here. There's a mental health issue going on here. Tell them to do abdominal breathing. So even before you get the brown bag or the non-rebreather that's not hooked up, tell them to look at their belly button, watch you go up and down once every two or three seconds, and that gives them a little biofeedback, a little self-control, 
you can keep typing your triage note calmly with your eye roll to yourself and maybe it'll start to calm down by that point. Okay. Do they need a big workup? Well, if you uncovered one of those risk factors that, you know, maybe they're diabetic, so you do want a blood sugar. Uh, maybe there has been some exposure, you know, by your history taking, you know, so the workup would be titrated to that. Hopefully we don't need to go do a bunch of stuff like blood gases and things like that. Um, so if we did do a blood, blood gas and they're in a respiratory alkalosis, their pH would be above 7.45 and their, their CO2 would be low. It'd be less than 35 because they're blowing it all off, right? That's what happens when you breathe fast, you drive your CO2 down. So that was your fill in the blanks there from the paragraph above. So medicines for them, you know, I've ruled out a medical cause. It's just a mental health issue. It's a stress thing. We've got some choices. Benzos are kind of our go-to thing for acute management. And that's okay for first-line treatment with, if they're that anxious. <clears throat> I'm going to, you know, make sure this person improves. At some point, we're going to discharge them. We might need to have a little conversation about things that trigger their stress or anxiety. You know, maybe it's some drama in their personal or family life. Maybe we can give some support to that or, you know, reassure them kind of thing. If we need to send them home with medicines, we, and they're not already on medicines, let's not start with benzos, okay? Benzos are not proven to be safe for long-term management. At best, they're good for a Band-Aid for a temporary, isolated, short-term use, okay? Now, if they're pretty adamant that this is a recurring thing and they're not already on a medicine, a safer thing is something like Atarax or Vistril or Hydroxazine. These are non-controlled. The potential for misuse uh, really doesn't exist. They're pretty safe. They're basically an antihistamine-based medicine. But they do have a labeled use for mild anxiety problems. And you know, if they do need a benzo or something other than that down the road, you'd rather start them out on something mild like this. So at least whoever the provider is can say, oh, we've tried that already. So now it justifies going to the next step. So something simple to go home with and some support. Pneumothorax. So this would be a hole, an air in our chest cavity. Um, we're going to get now, what we're talking about first is just the simple pneumothorax. So it's just a hole in the lung surface. We're not talking about tension pneumothorax yet. This is just, they basically like popped a bleb or there's a weak spot in the lung surface and it ruptured, the air leaked out and the lung collapsed some. They're probably gonna present with some breathing problem like shortness of breath, maybe some chest pain. Um, and it could be very mild. It could be pretty, it depends how big this pneumo is. Risk factors for a pneumo, will be anything that changes or has affected the normal lung surface, okay? In other words, if you have perfectly healthy, pink, super healthy lungs, it's not really a risk. Anything, smoking, environmental exposures, um, maybe certain medicines. If you've had one before, uh, here's another time the patient doesn't lie to you, by the way. If they say they've had a pneumothorax before, you might as well go ahead and get the x-ray. It's probably again. Okay, kind of like when mom says the baby's coming, don't question, just take a look and see. And then add to your list there, uh, Marfan syndrome or Ehlers-Danslos. Both of these conditions um, are actually considered connective tissue diseases. They've got some abnormality to the structure of a lot of their connective tissues and the lung surface is one of those tissues. So even like the Marfan's patient, we know they're tall and skinny. It's not because they're tall and skinny that puts them at risk. There's actually a defect with their tissues that they don't have the same integrity. Um, Ehlers-Danslos, these patients also, by the way, are at higher risk for vascular problems like subarachnoid hemorrhages, like aneurysms and dissections. So there's the, and you can look these up on your own, but as far as the pneumothorax, if they have one of these two, you might lean towards, yeah, let's go ahead and get the chest x-ray. Marfan's or Ehlers, sometimes Ehlers-Danslos is written as ED as a shorthand. So their exam, you're going to see some evidence now of that work of breathing or that decreased pulmonary capacity, right? They could actually, depends again how big this thing is. Lungs could be anything. They could be decreased, diminished, or absent. But if they're absent, we immediately stop and address it, all right? Absent is a stop, no-go word. All right, for lung sounds, because that means I might have a tension pneumothorax. 
All right, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, a pneumothorax can even have normal lung sounds if it's really small, okay? But decreased or diminished are typically the textbook words you'll see on the exam when we talk about a simple pneumothorax. Again, absent is a red flag word. It means you put a needle in the chest right now. So chest x-ray is the test I need. The, the diagnostic is most useful so we can actually see this pneumothorax. Now, if their presenting complaint was chest pain and maybe you don't really appreciate their work of breathing, the EKG might be the first thing we do because a lot of times we do that right there in triage as they're checking in, right? Or right there at the bedside if they, um, you know, they go straight back to the bed. Um, but at some point, the chest x-ray needs to be done because that's how we diagnose it. So here you see an x-ray of a pneumothorax. <clears throat> and this one is actually fairly significant, right? Collapsed pretty close to halfway over the chest. So all this black stuff. Now, in this case, remember the COPD person had a lot of black spaces and that was air, but you still saw some lung markings, some haziness there. Here, you see zero lung markings. This truly is just dead air space, okay? And of course, on the left side, it's still reinflated there, or it's still inflated. All right. So we're going to transition in from the simple pneumothorax to the, um, just checking my notes here. So I'm going to talk about these words again, as far as the uh, minute, diminished or decreased. We're going to get to the tension pneumothorax in just a minute. Um, this is one reason why having taking this test several times is useful to teaching the class because I can tell you on more than one occasion I've seen them asking a tension pneumothorax question that's the life threat and the only symptoms the patient had were markedly decreased lung sounds all right and typically that's not what we teach in classes and trauma classes and in services and all that we usually just say either decreased or diminished is a pneumothorax, and then absent is the tension pneumo. I knew the questions were about a tension pneumothorax because the only choices for interventions were possible for tension pneumothorax. So by definition, they had to have been describing a tension pneumothorax, but they used the word markedly decreased, and we don't usually do that. Now, since I saw it twice over a two-year period, I'm pretty confident that it was not one of their research or beta test questions that are researching for validity of the exam to have seen it twice. So I'm going to tell you guys, if you ever see the adverb markedly, significantly, um, whatever, some other modifying word added onto decreased or diminished, you need to step that up to attention pneumothorax, okay? Um, again, it's just not something we normally do when we teach, we write, we author stuff. We st typically stick with just absent lung sound. But again, by experience, I'm going to tell you, markedly changes the game. Okay. So take that for what it's worth. Um, hopefully that's not a stressor to you guys, um, but hopefully that's a benefit that I was able to share that with you guys. All right. So whatever their pneumothorax, but it be a simple or a tension, at some point they need a chest tube. Okay. Chest tube goes in, we're gonna get a chest x-ray right away. That first chest x-ray is just to make sure it's in the right place. They don't always re-expand immediately. Sometimes they start to. The one we do three or four hours later, that's for re-expansion. The first one is just for placement, okay? If it does re-expand right, hey, great, bonus points, but that's not why we do it. We do it for placement. By four hours, they better be out of my ER, right? They better be upstairs. Um, hemothorax, so this is a collection of blood between the lung and the chest wall. And usually this is a pneumo also. Let's face it, the bullet or the knife or whatever went through the chest wall to cause the hemothorax probably didn't stop right between the lung and the chest wall. It probably went through the lung also. So usually you get both, okay? The nice thing is a chest tube will fix both of these. You'll get the blood out and you'll get the air out also. So we put that chest tube in and the blood starts coming. It starts coming out, we're watching we're still doing our assessments and we're doing our, and we look down it's still going still going if it has not stopped and it hits one liter somebody better draw that to someone's attention and say hey we just hit one liter non-stop and it's still coming that's about a fourth of your circulating volume that's in that chest drain now 
And that tells us two things. One, there's probably more in there. Two, there's something still bleeding. They need to go to the operating room. Now, the other parameter here, the 200 an hour for three or four hours, they should be out of your ER by then, okay? So that's not gonna be on the test and that's well beyond emergency care period. But that is something that nurses like in a CVICU will watch in their post thoracotomies is they will watch it and if it continues to bleed that much, even slow like that, they'll call the on-call part, hey, your guy's still bleeding, he needs to go back to the OR, all right? R's for ER people, if we get a thousand out initially, OR, all right? Um, auto transfusion, so hemothorax, this is one of the times we can give the patient's own blood back to them, possibly. Uh, of course, we have to assess, you know, if they got any spiritual or cultural beliefs, you know, against that. Uh, Jehovah's Witness, Scientologists, and I think there's one other that may have some issues with this. So even though it's their own blood, there's some beliefs that say once it's left the body, they don't want it back in. So we have to ask those questions sometimes. All right, so tension with So this is one of our life threats. This is something you will die from in a minute or so unless it's addressed. And that's why when you see or hear those absent or markedly decreased or markedly diminished lungs. Once you are given that information, you stop. You do nothing else, but you address this possible life threat, okay? And that's part of our primary assessment. If there's any life threat in the primary assessment, you stop and address it. For example, you go up to your patient, they're not breathing, and you open the airway and there's an airway obstruction. You don't continue to check the breathing or the pulse. You deal with the airway obstruction first, okay? So the problem here is, now most likely to get a tension pneumothorax, you don't just have a hole on the chest wall, you've probably got a hole on the lung, you've probably got a hole on the chest wall also. So you actually have two opportunities for air to come in and fill this space, shifting the lung over. Now, the collapsed lung is not the problem, I mean, it is a problem, but it's not what's gonna kill that patient. All right, you can live off just half your lungs. Many people have had lobectomies for cancer, for lung cancer, do fine on one set of lungs. What you die from is this air pressure as it compresses your great vessels and turns off the blood flow coming out of the heart. So it's this basically turning the valve off from this increased air pressure, this tension compressing these vessels. And this person will be in shock. What type of shock is this? Of what, under what family? Yes, it's an obstructive shock. And again, the way the ENA and TNCC categorize these, if it's an obstructive process, you fix it by relieving the obstruction. How do I relieve the obstruction? I get the pressure off the vessels by evacuating this air. Okay, reinflating the lung is not the answer. It that happens when you take the air out. Okay, because the deflated lung is not the problem. It's the air pressure in here is the problem. <laughs> And get the air out, relieve the pressure. Yes, the lung will re-expand at some point. That's nice. But the main thing is I need to keep my patient perfusing uh, through the great vessels there. So here's a real x-ray of one. And what do you see here? Well, there's all the black. And this is actually part of the lung pressing well past midline. Okay. Again, it's that pressure on the mediastinum in here from all this air pressure, all this tension building up you relieve the tension. The treatment is a 14 gauge or larger. I actually have a 10 gauge I carry. Um, it's actually designed for this. Um, it's in my travel bag. 14 or larger, the length is important, okay? You cannot, I mean, you can use your normal trauma 14 gauge, but that's only an inch and a quarter. And science shows that about a third of the time, it is not long enough to get completely into that air cavity. Because let's face it, some people have thicker, bigger chest walls than others. Science tells us that at three and a quarter inches, all right, so a long 14 gauge, at three and a quarter inches, you will reach the pleural cavity 100% of the time. So the length is what's important. And we've kind of gone back and forth as far as the location. So TNCC 7th edition was saying you could consider the mid axillary line a potential alternate site. The eighth edition has now come back and it is going strictly with the second intercostal midclavicular on the affected side, which is the affected side, the side with no lung sounds, the side with probably the hole in the chest. Uh, that might be a big clue right there, right? 
So second intercostal space up and over that rib, <clears throat> mid clavicular line, and then reassess. Now, <clears throat> is this emergency needle decompression going to reinflate that lung? No. You can only, this lung can only reinflate when you reestablish a negative pressure in here. It's the negative pressure that keeps the lung like glued or vacuumed against the chest wall. That's why it's collapsed. You've lost the negative pressure like that keeps it attached there. That 14 gauge needle is not evacuating all that air. You need to have suction hooked up to pull out the air and reestablish a negative pressure that will then pull the lung over there. All you're doing with a needle is taking some of that tension. You're, you're basically trying to equalize the pressure from in here versus the outside world. So, so they're equal pressures. So it's not pressing on the mediastinum. That's all you're doing for that emergency needle decompression. Okay. To get the lung to reinflate and resolve this, you need a chest tube with some negative suction to it to pull all the air. You actually have to pull that air out to get the negative pressure in there. All right. So even going back to the chest, does a chest tube reinflate a lung? No. A chest tube reestablishes negative pressure of vacuum that holds the lung against the chest wall okay that's actually what we're doing there was a, <clears throat> a video that flowed around some of the um, emergency ems facebook sites it was a, a little video showing a laparoscope inside a chest cavity i believe it was either a cadaver or like a goat or something i don't know but it actually showed the 14 gauge going in and the lung re-expanding you did not see what it was hooked to I guarantee you for it to re-expand, it had to be hooked to suction, okay? Even, just know this, what's the likelihood, even just passively, of a, even a 14 gauge to even allow all that air out, okay? It's just an emergency life-saving measure, reduce the tension, equalize the pressure between the two so that you have blood flow through the mediastinum. You're keeping your patient alive till they can get that chest tube they really need, all right? Your, uh, see, we did that pulmonary embolus. So where does this come from? It came from a DVT, all right? Now, are there people that spontaneously generate PEs in their lungs? Yes, there are. That is the zebra in the desert. Those are people that have some uh, blood clotting abnormalities, some other intrinsic issues with their hematological system. That is not a majority of people that have PEs, okay? Most people that have a P an acute PE, it came from a DVT that was either missed, they didn't know it, or it wasn't treated adequately. That's why we treat the DVTs to prevent that. So that's what will be on the exam. Not these people with these alpha, theta, protein, whatever deficiencies and things like that. Okay, so let's get rid of the zebras. If that PE is big enough to cause a pulmonary artery obstruction, what are they not getting to their lungs? If their pulmonary artery has this huge saddle embolus, what is not getting past that? Well, not the O2, but the blood from the right side of the heart is not getting there. And no blood out of the right side means no blood to the lungs. No blood to the lungs means no blood to the left side, which means no blood to your organs. So a large PE is also a type of shock. Again, an obstructive shock because you're obstructing the blood flow from the right side of the heart, which is eventually going to translate to no peripheral blood pressure. Okay. And again, it's an obstructive shock. You relieve the obstruction the PE. Most useful symptom on your assessment, when I mean, you consider all things, shortness of breath, uh, low pulse ox, a low PaO2, all those are fine. The heart rate, I'm going to tell you more specific or more, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it's not specific, but it's much more sensitive than all of those is a patient has an unexplained, and you can add this word, progressive shortness of breath. In other words, for no re why has this person been getting short of breath all day long, getting worse? You know, now it's just like, like they, they, they got short of breath walking from their office desk to the cafeteria. Later in the day, they got short of breath just walking to the restroom. Now they can't even make it to their coworker's desk and they're short of breath. And they've not had any recent cold symptoms, no cough, no fever. You know, they're not in some morbidly out of shape condition. Okay, an unexplained progressive shortness of breath needs to get our attention for sure. Okay. 
Um, if you've had a PE or a DVT before, you're gonna be higher risk no matter how well you take your medicines, right? Kind of like that stroke risk. If you had a stroke before, you're always at risk for another one, no matter how well you take care of yourself. And then all the other same risk factors for the DVT are the same for the PE because that's where it came from. So of course, increased work of breathing at some point, maybe hypotensive if it's a large, nearly obstructing clot, and the lung sounds could really be anything. I mean, it just depends how big this thing is. All right, so D-dimer, same rationale for the DVT for the PE. Are we going to use it to test for it or to prove it's not there? We're going to use that as a rule out. So I, lose it. I use this for my low risk person. For example, maybe that person has a new onset of shortness of breath for no known reason, but they've got no risk factors for it. Not on hormones, they don't smoke, no surgery, no cancer, no recent trauma, no prolonged immobility. They got none of the risk factors. Okay, so P is still on my radar, but it's not the likely answer. So I would want to do a D dimer on that person. If they got the risk factors, don't do it. Get them to the scanner, scan their chest. So D dimer to rule out. CT would be the best test because it actually shows the clot and you can, the clinician can actually see how much of an obstruction there may or may not be there. If they can't do the CT for whatever reason, then it's off to VQ. Now VQ will not show you the clot, but it will show you the area that is not perfusing. Okay. And there's many things that can cause a VQ abnormality. You can have a focal pneumonia. Okay. Sometimes um, you sometimes people with emphysema have more damage in one lobe or segment than the other, and they'll have a VQ mismatch also. So VQ does not show the clot. That's why they'll never say it is a clot or it's 100% um, probability. They either get to say low, medium, or high, and they can never say zero either, okay, because it will not see it and it may not be causing a mismatch yet. So best test is CT to actually see it and to know how big it is. And once we diagnose that, you go on some anticoagulants. So again, we're not using the new ones yet for the CEN. So it's gonna be either some heparin or some um, Lovenox or Fragmin. Fragmin is a, a Lovenox alternate um, to start. It just depends on provider's choice. Now, are those medicines, are those medicines, um, yep, I'm gonna answer that in just a minute. Do heparin or Lovenox or even when they go on the Coumadin, do those dissolve the clot? No. Once you have a clot, it is a high risk or a high probability that more things can lodge onto there and make it bigger. A clot is like a magnet for more debris, all right? We don't want that to happen. We don't want to be suddenly become an obstructing clot. The other thing is if a clot's big enough, pieces of it could break off and go downstream and lodge somewhere and become another magnet for more accumulation. So we put them on heparin or Lovenox and frag or Fragman and then eventually Coumadin to prevent it from extending or causing complications. Well, how do you get rid of the clot? Your body has its own enzymes that will eat it up eventually. Okay, we just need to put it like a pause on it that it can't get any bigger or go anywhere. So that's how you get rid of your DVT actually. It's not the Coumadin, it's not the Lovenox. And so what uh, Karen just asked here, if you are coding a patient with, a, with PEA, H's and T's says P could be a reason. Why don't we give fibrolytics or anticoagulants? Good question. So from ACLS, your H's and T's, um, hypoxemia, hypovolemia, hypothermia, hyperkalemia, hypokalemia. I forgot the other H. Then you got tamponade, tension pneumothorax, thrombus, meaning big PE. You got your toxins. And what was the other one? There's one more T. But yes, um, PE, thrombus is one of the T's. So we consider that. So here's, here's the rule as far as why don't we clot bust these things. If you actually look at the package label, the insert, whatever, the FDA label for uh, TPA is if you're looking at it for a PE, there's two rules. First rule is you have to know that it's a PE. You don't just randomly give TPA to people because they're coding. You got to know that the, the PE is there. Say so they had to have been scanned already. And then the second criteria is they have to suddenly crash, like right in front of your eyes. And what you're basically doing is you're saying, hmm, they just crashed. They've got a large obstructing PE. That must be what killed, was fixing to kill them. Consider the TPA. So we don't want to give it just random willy-nilly. Oh, just because we're coding somebody, let's look for the evidence. So we don't typically see this in the ER. And I've asked a few of my attendings over the years about it. Hey, when you were in residency, did you ever see this done? 
And every time the answer was when they said yes, it was in an ICU setting because the patient was already admitted for a large pulmonary embolus clot. They were critical and unstable, and then suddenly they crashed. So you had both parts of the, the drug label, a known PE currently, and they crashed, and you're assuming the crash is because of that. And then it's still considered because what are you doing? You're giving TPA to someone, you're making them at risk for bleeding, and think of all their invasive lines. Think of we may have just been doing chest compressions just before this while someone's getting the TPA, and those chest compressions will leave some soft tissue damage, plus the TPA, they're gonna have some bleeding. So it's not that you can't do it, it's just not commonly done, but those are actually the two, um, the two rules of using it. You have to know that's what it is, and the patient suddenly crash. And we just don't, again, in our setting in the ER, we, they should be out of the ER well before that. You know, well, PE, get your heparin going, get your orders, get them upstairs, right? It's just not likely we're gonna see it that often. In our ICU, they can go to IR, or some peripheral vascular surgeon place machine, actually the embolus. Yes, if the patient's stable, depending on the capacity and the services you have, just like I told you at our stroke center, we would do thrombectomies and retrievals for the thrombotic strokes. You can do the same thing for this as well too. Obviously you want a stable patient. Um, you know, if they're unstable, you gotta do resuscitation first. But yeah, absolutely. They can go up and breathe that thing and remove it just like we do with the, um, uh, we use the Mercy retrieval device a lot at that other hospital. Yeah, and again, if they do a surgery or a procedure, that's a more specific targeted therapy just towards the blood clot, whereas giving the TPA, that's gonna go everywhere in their body, okay? And all the tissues at risk for bleeding. Yeah, so they have to go open their chest up maybe or do some uh, vascular procedure, but they're going right to the source of the problem. So that's, that's directed therapy, whereas TPA is more of a distributive type therapy. Good points. All right, ARDS. These days with coronavirus, all of us are probably ARDS experts these days, right? ARDS has always been there. Remember, ARDS is not a disease to itself. ARDS is a consequence of some lung insult. In the case of our current situation is due to what we're learning about is this inflammatory response to the, um, the virus, the coronavirus. And, you know, scientists are looking at the cytokines, the different uh, receptor sites, and this storm of this inflammation response. So at the end of the day, it's still ARDS, whether it be from coronavirus or it be from what we more commonly know and talk about, things like our inhalational injuries, our near drownings. Um, maybe they brought this person out of a structure fire and then held a bunch of these hot, superheated gases, things like that. It's still the same response. It's just the cause is different, what we're talking about. And basically, ARDS is a normal expected response out of control. It's a normal response when your lung tissue gets inflamed or upset or irritated from whatever. It's a normal response for the tissue to respond and this inflammatory fluid is gonna to go to the site of the insult, the pores open up and that fluid rushes in. The problem with ARDS is this is an insult to a majority or all lung tissue. So all of the fluid rushes in everywhere. Okay, so it's a normal response but it's an overwhelming response is what it is, okay? It is part of our inflammatory response. And it can either be acute respiratory distress or adult respiratory, it, it's the same thing either which way you slice it. And what basically happens is this person fills up from the inside with fluid, basically drowning in their own fluid, okay? And eventually completely whites out on the x-ray and you know, very minimal functional capacity left as far as their oxygen exchanging capacity. Could also be hypotensive from this massive fluid shift. Could also have degrees of failing cardiac output from this massive pulmonary edema load that the body's trying to deal with. So one of the things that clue us in that it's ARDS, not just the x-ray, but what's the history? Something had to have happened to trigger this to start. Now ARDS is typically not an ER problem, okay? It doesn't happen in the first 30 minutes, the first hour usually of some of these uh, antecedent events. So this is usually more of an ICU situation, but why are we talking about it? Why is that on the scene exam? Because it's one of these things we need to be aware of that as we do transfers and transitions of care, we're communicating to the other care teams, 
what this person could go into if they don't watch them closely. What would their last chest x-ray look like? What was, their, what was their last ABG? Things like that. What was their initial lung injury? You know, was it inhalation or was it some blunt trauma kind of thing? Okay. So hypotensive, tachycardic, and it's progressive respiratory distress because they're filling up. You know, eventually the lung sounds are going to be nil, you know, hardly anything at all. It's, they don't have enough lung space to move those air, the, to move the air. Right. We can have sepsis as a cause also. Some of that inflammatory storm we see with our septic, uh, our sepsis markers, those inflammatory toxins released by the bacterial infection can trigger this too. And the chest texture is going to get worse and worse and worse. So we don't really talk about treatments for this. This person needs to be intubated, basically, because you've got to have positive pressure. We've got to do some ventilation modalities. Um, everybody now knows about proning. I mean, we always, we did proning for run-of-the-mill ARDS for decades. We just didn't experience it enough to know that's what everybody's doing. It's like now we're all doing it. You know, it's now like, oh, yeah, let's do that. We've always done that. You know, and what we also know about coronavirus, proning early can make a huge difference, even your stable patients. Right? Um, other ARDS cases, we didn't even think about proning until they got you know, pretty much unstable or started to have some decline. Some of that interesting stuff with coronavirus now is um, start your supplemental oxygen, have them lay flat you know, when they're still awake and alert and doing well. And we may actually avert or avoid having to go more invasive on these patients. Okay, so we're gonna talk about intubation. So this is one of our procedures for uh, respiratory. So intubation, of course, does have some risks. And we need to make sure that when we intubate somebody, we're doing it for the right reasons. Okay, we need to say, yeah, the benefits of the intubation do outweigh the risk. The days of, so, what do I mean by social intubation? Because the days of that are gone. It did exist for a while. There was, there was a time when you had some of these crotchety old, you know, family practice ER doctors, if that guy in room seven doesn't shut up, I'm gonna tube his, you know what? social intubation for the wrong reasons, okay? Hopefully no one's doing that anymore. Because you know what? You're going to type an ICU bed and there are possible risks, okay? So contraindications. Are there really any contraindications if a patient needs an airway? No, they're all relative. Because if you ain't got an airway, you ain't got a patient, right? So what if they have sustained some blast injury or massive facial, they, you know, they got their face caved in, you know, by some thugs. All right, and you got no landmarks. You may not even have a jaw. All right, well, cut their neck, put a trach in them. Okay, um, so I did some uh, training with some of the rangers, some of the ranger medics, um, and a lot of these tactical medicine classes. And it's pretty neat because they have to think of stuff outside the box. And some of these guys get blast injuries where their face is basically gone. So one guy told me, he says, Hey, you can always use your fingers and stick them about where the trachea is and feel for some rigid cartilage. Feel for those rigid tracheal rings and slide the ET tube right over your fingers. Interesting, that's thing outside the box. So I've heard guys say, look where the bubbling's coming from, where their face used to be, you know, and aim for that target, okay? But, you know, civilian world, we don't see that. We can cut their neck, all right? Cervical spine injury. So how do we deal with that if we think it's a C-spine? Well, the nice thing is a lot of us are using those video laryngoscopes these days. And if you haven't noticed, next time you see one, look, there's not a lot of head tilt that has to happen for those video laryngoscopes. They just kind of slide in, right? Because you're not having to look direct line of sight anymore. You're looking through a camera that's behind the tongue and the posterior pharynx. So that takes care of a lot of see. If we do need to do some of the jaw, we're doing a jaw thrust rather than a head tilt. So there's more than one way to skin a cat. So there's really no true reason you can't establish establishing airway in a patient. So RSI is, uh, with your eighth edition TNCC, it is going to be called DAI, Drug Assisted Intubation. And the other airway lectures from other authors and presenters and other classes are moving towards this phraseology also. They're taking the rapid out of it because they want to remind us that this process should be controlled, calm, stepwise, planned out, methodical. So really, we really want to consider it rapid 
All right, so DAI is a new catchphrase, drug assisted. And they're not gonna ask you on an exam. I'm just saying if you read some other products or study materials, you may already see that phraseology changing. But DA, it's still the same procedure. We just wanna change our mindset. Structured, stepwise, controlled. And most everybody is using the seven P's method. TNCC is using it also. So the first P is to prepare and get everything ready. Next P is to pre-oxygenate. This is a very important step we don't think of a lot of times. Of course, the obvious thing is by giving, you're thinking giving more oxygen. Well, there's actually more to it than that. So when you take a breath, right now, sit in front of your computer or whatever, you're gonna breathe in the same gas that is in the room around you. So your next breath includes 21% oxygen, about 70 some odd percent uh, CO2. Um, I'm sorry, is that right? No, 21% oxygen, about 70% nitrogen, and about 20 something, I'm sorry, about 10% something CO2. That's the same gas that's in your lungs. And that nitrogen is in your lungs. That nitrogen is useless to you to oxygenate. So when I pre-oxygenate my patient, yes, I'm giving them more oxygen, but what I'm actually doing is every time they take a breath, what I'm hoping is as the nitrogen goes out, I'm putting more oxygen molecules in to take their space. It's called nitrogen washout. And studies have shown with a full denitrogenation of their lungs, you can actually have a prolonged hypoxic time in the two and three and four minute time range. Wow, that's amazing, right? So they're gonna breathe that non rebreather for three minutes to try and wash out that nitrogen, all right? Pre-treatment, all right? Um, so these, these things, we're gonna treat them, give them some meds before we intubate them, okay? Before we paralyze. You. So sedation and whatever drug you want, the ENA does not care. They don't have any favorites because you know different providers like different things these days. And then we've got two drugs we're going to consider. We're going to call our consider drugs. Okay, I'm going to take you back a few years. At this point, you would you would give by default every head injury patient some lidocaine to protect the ICP from spiking. Years ago, you would give every pediatric patient some atropine at this point. Not to dry them up, because it doesn't work that quick. You're gonna give it to protect their vagus nerve, because remember, oxygenation, uh, poor oxygenation causes bradycardia in kids, and if you stimulate their gag response, their vagal response, when you intubate them, they're gonna drop their heart rate even more. So atropine protects that. Current, currently what we do is we say, consider these, meaning it's up to the provider yeah, Doc, it's a head injury. Do you want some lidocaine? No, nah, we're okay. His ICP is okay, blah, blah, blah. Uh, hey, Doc, it's a kid. Do you want some atropine before we do this? No, heart rate's good. SAT's good. We're probably okay without it. So it's a consider issue these days, but it's, this would still be the time to do it. And then paralysis. So succinylcholine or nectine is one of the common ones we reach for. We like it because it works pretty quick and it wears off quick. Um, Rock uranium, it actually doesn't work, doesn't take much longer than sucks to work, it just lasts longer. And there's a lot more sa um, safety issues with sucks. So you may see some of your providers moving more towards the rock uranium. You don't need to pick one or the other. Um, you don't need to worry about dosages. All right, P for placement. So Selic maneuver, another name for cricoid pressure. Again, today with a lot of the video scopes, you don't need that. Now, if they're still doing direct visualization where they're getting down there and looking down into the trachea with the handheld laryngoscope, sometimes they want you to push that trachea down so they can see it better. All right, so that's up to the intubator to ask for that if they want or not. And then P for proof. So the tube's in, let's look for all our evidence, which we'll do in a minute. How can we prove it's in the right place? And then P for post intubation, meaning reassess my patient, make sure the tube's secured. If you're doing entitled CO2, now the time to start it. So we've got 10 ways you can check ET tube placement. Um, some are quicker than others. There is no perfect way. There's, there's failures with every one of these or potential failures. Some have a higher likelihood of failures or not. I'll tell you the only perfect test, the only perfect way to know if they're intubated successfully or not, it's not even on this list and it's actually gonna be a bad day. The only perfect way is during their post-mortem exam when the ME actually opens the trachea and sees the tube laying inside the trachea. 
that's the only perfect way because there's failures or potential failures of all of these. Okay. The one I'm going to take a minute and talk about while you're writing these down is the esophageal detector device. <clears throat> I've seen this on the exam a couple times, not, not a couple times on the same test, but over a couple tests I've seen it. And it is an airway, it's not an airway device, it's an airway confirmation device. I'll show you the picture in a minute. I'm going to give you all a minute to write some of these in. But the reason I want to talk about it is because it's a educational psychology concept, a testing psychology concept, that if you see something that is not the right answer, but you have a very slight familiarity, at least you know it's an airway device, even though another answer looks like the right answer, and it really is, we as humans are hard on ourselves. We're going to say, oh, esophageal detection, that's an airway checking device. Oh, I should know how to use that. I need to pick it. It's probably the right answer. Okay. It, it's, a, it's a psychology thing. We're hard on ourselves. Even though we know something else is the better answer, we fault ourselves and say, darn it, you should have paid attention in that, that little EMS in-service they came and did with you guys or whatever. So I better pick this as the right answer. Okay. So that's the psychology to it. So every time I've seen on the test, it was not the right answer. Okay. Cause I knew what it was. I worked EMS. It was not the right answer, but it was a definite distractor. If anybody needs me to leave this slide up, just type a yes right quick. Otherwise, I'm going to go to the next picture. Was that a yes for right now, Lisa? No, I think, okay, all right, so I'm gonna go to the next picture then. All right, so here is the device. There's two forms of it. One is simply just a little bulb you see on the top of the screen. The other one is actually a, a plunger, like a, a syringe. Um, they both work the same way. You'll notice uh, the ends on both these are the universal female end that hooks to the end of an ET tube. The, the ET tube would have the male end. The other, end, the other side is the female end, all right, makes sense. Um, so it's the same fitting. It's just how they work. So on the bulb, the paramedic would squeeze the air out and attach this to the ET tube and they would let go. If that bulb springs back briskly, you could assume that the tube is in the trachea because the trachea is rigid. And as you suck that air out, it should not collapse around the ET tube. If it was in the esophagus and the paramedic let go, after you squeeze, it would stay depressed because the esophagus is soft, so it's going to suck up and stick to the ET tube, all right? The, the plunger syringe works the same way. Rather than just allowing it to re-expand by itself, you actually pull back on it. If you feel resistance, you think esophagus. If the plunger pulls back nice and easy, you're like, okay, trachea. Remember, they're not 100% because what if you were bagging this patient and all your air was going to their gut and their gut's distended and you intubated their gut and you put this device on here and you pull back, it could pull back very easy if you're sucking that air out, right? So again, none of these tools is 100%, all right? But when we use as many tools as we have at hand, that's where we get a reliable indication of placement. Um, as far as auscultation, so it is a standard now. You listen over the epigastrum first, okay? And then your lung fields. Why? Because if you do hear gastric sounds, okay, it's not 100%, but if you do hear gastric sounds, it's definitely a possibility that you're in the stomach and you need to get out of there ASAP because all those breaths you're giving are not going to the lungs, okay? So you only move to the lung fields after you hear it's clear or the epigastrum, okay? So we're gonna hook them up to the ventilator. <clears throat> and a ventilator works by positive pressure. Humans breathe by negative pressure, okay? And that's the difference. Once you reverse that process with a machine, there's the potential for things to go wrong. Nothing is as perfect as the human organism, okay? My doorbell's fixing to go off. So there are three settings, and these are just your safety settings. These, these are not the ventilator delivery settings. These are your safety or alarm settings. It will alarm if either too much air goes in, maybe there's a leak, or not enough air goes in, like an obstruction. It will alarm if it meets too much resistance, like there's an obstruction. It will alarm if there's low pressure, 
like a leak. It will alarm if it takes too much time for the air to go in because you will have it set for about that same I to E, about one to two. Let's say the machine detects, oh, it took two seconds instead of one to get the 400 mLs in. Maybe there's a leak somewhere. And it will also alarm if the, um, it takes too long to get the air out because maybe a leak also. So if you just slow down for a second and, and remember, just like the A lines, can you go in the room and see if the ventilator is just functioning and doing its job? That's all I need because anything else you're gonna call RT, all right? And if there's any questions about these alarm settings, just put your mouse down and just stop for a second and think. Okay, it's, it's alarming because there's too much pressure. It means too much resistance. What could be causing that? An obstruction, biting the tube, uh, a clog, a kink. Okay, just slow down and think about it. It's not rocket science, but it's not something that, you know, if we're an ICU person, we do this crap, they do that crap all day long, all right? We do it infrequently enough that it's kind of a learning curve every time we have to deal with these things. All right. If you can't find the cause for the problem, get them off the machine. That's a very hard situation to defend if the machine is actually the problem and you leave a patient on a malfunctioning machine. Take them off, start doing it manually. It's going to give you a little more clues to how they're responding and so on. We're going to do frequent reassessments in the ER setting we're probably leaning more towards the two hour minimum, okay? Because our patients are just now stabilizing. In the ICU setting, um, it's about a two to four hour window, all right? We're probably doing assessments a lot more often initially right after the intubation, all right? But, but the t if, if there's a suddenly a mass casualty that comes in and it's all hands on deck and you got someone on a vent, you better break out and at least go check that person every two hours at a minimum, even if you're still waiting for a bed. All right, so dope. This is still standard with ACLS, and it's just your little um, memory pathway or flow sheet when you're trying to troubleshoot and consider what could be going on, why are these alarms going off, etc. All right, so D stands for dislodgement. So how do we check for that? We we'll get a chest X-ray. We check to see if the tube is still at 21 centimeters. Uh, maybe they've actually extubated. That's a dislodgement, right? All right, so. Pick your test or what are you going to do for that? O is for obstruction. So it could be blood, could be mucus, could be kink tubing, could be time for more sedation. They're biting the tube or they're fighting against it. They're bucking the vent. In other words, it's trying to put the air in and they're, they're anxious and they're not letting the machine do the work and they're resisting it. So that's a high pressure alarm. So it might need for sedation. P is pneumothorax because this is positive pressure. And if something goes wrong, you can break loose some, you know. And so how we check for that? Check chest x-ray, listen to lung sounds. What's their pulse ox doing? What's their most recent blood gas doing? Maybe you have an A-line, you could run one right now. And then E for equipment, all right? And I suggest start at the patient and work your way backwards, okay? Because it kind of looks bad if you go in there and start checking the ventilator and make it all the way to the patient, turn around, and they're holding the ET tube for you. Now, I know that would not really happen, but you definitely lose all your street cred if that were to happen. So start the patient and work your way towards the machine. So I've got just some slides here for you. People send me a lot of stuff. And they, I, this is one of my things I love seeing is all these airway fails. So a little humor here for you for a moment. So Lord knows what the heck is going on here. So you know, maybe she's having some hypersalivation thing. Maybe it's organophosphate. I don't know. But hey, even then, no one has taped off this port here. So there's really not even suction going on here. So I don't, are they trying to, and I don't know any of these movies or what was the story. But hey, please pay me. I can do better medical advisement than these people can. Yeah, no words. I got nothing. I guess better. How about this one? So much for your tube securing device, right? <laughs> tie it around the neck. <laughs> We're at 21 centimeters at the chin, at the neck, right? Yeah, hang man, wait till she wakes up. Nice. Let's see. What? What is it? That tube is backwards, y'all. That's the cuff sticking out of his mouth. They've got it in the wrong way. And I guess he still needs that supplemental um, oxygen too. Well, of course, because the ET tube is not hooked up to nothing. <laughs> All right. I like that tape job. You think that's enough to keep it in place there? 
All right. Now this one may actually have something to it. So, and again, I don't know any stories behind these, but maybe they're doing this as an alternate, like a, a balloon epistaxis treatment, you know, using a foot possibly. But I would think there'd be a, if we need to do this, I'm thinking there'd be a lot more blood around this patient, you know, if it was that bad. Again, I don't know. But how about this one? It's not even an ET tube, it's an NG tube. <laughs> and they've got the, the clamp end of it. That's the end that goes over here when you clamp it. They got that going. There's, this is a, a dead end. There's nothing that goes through here. Yeah, great. I think I got one more for you. Talk about a direct nebulizer. You know, I want to get that nebulizer so close to get the maximal effect out of it. Let's just stick it in his mouth and secure it there so he has no choice. Interesting. I think that's the last one. So there you go. There's a few. Yeah, that was it. There's a few for you. Yeah, crazy. I can do a better job. All right, in tidal CO2 monitoring. So this is this is considered our standard of care now for our intubated patients, our conscious sedation patients, measuring the exhaled CO2, letting us know that the patient's oxygen. Okay, it's the same CO2 number as the blood gases. 35 to 45 is the range I want. Now we've got more contemporary nice devices that are actually built into our systems. But if you had to make it simple and go old school, you know, 20 years ago we just had these devices that plug between the male end, this is the female end, so this goes on the ET tube, this goes on the ventilator circuit, and it's just a sensor, okay? And it chemically detects how much CO2 is going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and sends it via the wire to your monitor. So again, like the A-line, how do I know it's working? That's all you do is walk in the room, oh, it looks good, we're good, I can go make rounds on my next room. This is your functional CO2 waveform. All right, it should go up sharply because as you exhale, and, you, and if you're perfusing, <laughs> as you exhale, the CO2 value should rise quickly because you're giving off what you just exchanged, all right? And then a slight a short plateau, and you start your next breath in, and the CO2 goes down quickly because you're breathing in more oxygen than CO2, okay? Almost a rectangle, a nice box, okay? It's working good. There's no questions about troubleshooting this, about adjusting therapy, things like that. There's whole, you know, in-services on, again, the different waveforms, you know, the, the waves, the pyramids, the stair step, the stat, all that. Is it working? Am I good? Do I know the basics? That's all you need. And then our chest tubes. So chest tubes, they're going to go into the fourth intercostal space. Now, they're going through the muscle at the fourth intercostal space. Sometimes they'll go through the skin here also, but some physicians, some providers will go down to the sixth space, make their incision there, go under the skin, under the fat, not go Nobody's through here. the muscle yet, and they'll tunnel up here to the fourth and then puncture through the muscle. They're basically making like a Z track. Why is that a good thing? Because if this tube were to accidentally pull out, you don't have a direct hole to the outside world. It's got that seal there, okay. that Z-trap. Or when it is time to pull it, they can pull it. They'll still put a dressing on it. And again, you've got this self-sealing kind of protective layer here. So just if you, there's anything about this, just read the question slowly. They're going into the chest cavity at the fourth intercostal space. Sometimes they also go through the skin at the fourth, but sometimes they also go through the skin at the sixth, the fifth or sixth. All right, both are fine. Uh, both are alternates, and that's the reason why they do that. And then we're hooking to a drainage unit. This is an atrium. Uh, the other two common ones are Sahara and Pluravac, and I think that covers about 99% of all of us. We use one of those three. They all work the same. They are all the same three container system from the old school nursing when they had three bottles. We've just put them into one commercial device now. I can take care of that. Let me know if that's any better. It looks like everybody is on mute or let me know if there's still a problem. Um, so if there's any questions about checking the chest tube function, make it simple and think about how it was old school. It was three separate devices like these because these are the same things just in that one package, okay? Um, you have 
collection chamber where if there's any blood like a hemothorax, it accumulates in here, all right? And then we have the water seal, which is basically our safety seal to keep air from coming from the outside world into my patient. So it's like a one-way valve. And then we have this pressure regulating container. Now, most of us just fill this to the recommended level and hook it to suction, okay? Um, it's okay, we're adults, we have lives, it's no big deal. Um, I've got jets occasionally and I had lawnmowers this morning, so. Um, so there's not a lot of science to this, but actually if you, if you studied about chest tubes, there's actually a way you can regulate how much pressure is being influenced by how much water you put in here. It has to do with how much atmospheric pressure is pushing down that column. But we're not worried about that. We just fill it up to the manufacturer's level and hook it up to suction. All right. So here on the atrium, all right, this is the collection chamber. That's where that blood's going to collect. You can measure it. This is your water seal. And this is your, um, your pressure regulating here. Okay. The water seal is for us to manage and monitor this device. This is kind of like, it also tells us is our things working. I should see some gentle fluctuations with each respiratory cycle, not, not sloshing up and sucking, but a little gentle back and forth. And if I see some gentle bubbling, that's okay also. I don't want to see boiling. Okay, I don't want to see rolling, frothing stuff in here. Gentle bubbling, slight fluctuations, it's working fine. So it is an invasive device, so we need to routinely assess it. <clears throat> when you clamp a chest tube, some people say never. The risk of clamping it is you can allow that air to build up in their chest cavity and cause that tension in the thorax. However, you do need to, you never want this open to the outside world. You're gonna lose the benefit of that negative pressure you've been trying to accumulate for their hemo or their pneumo. So anytime you have to disconnect the system, you do need to clamp it, all right? And I recommend if you clamp it, that you just hold it by hand. So that forces you to stay right there with the patient. Because what if you put the big Kelly clamps on there and all of a sudden the guy next door codes and you run to go help your coworkers at, oops, you've had it clamped for the last 20 minutes. Oh my gosh. So if you do it by hand, it forces you to go ahead and change the unit out if that's what you're doing or if it was broken, or whatever you had to do. And I also suggest step two, to remind you about the minute, is when you clamp it, hold your breath. If you have to take a breath before you're done, whatever you're doing, unclamp it or uncrimp it for one moment, let that pressure quickly equalize, clamp it again, hold your breath again. It's like when we're doing intubation. Um, if I'm at the head of the bed helping out where, where I work, I, I don't do intubations there but I'm always up there to help out and be a backup person. So I'm usually doing the suction. As soon as my intubator starts to go in, I hold my breath because no one else in the room is thinking of this. Everybody's adrenaline, you know, especially the I hold my breath. And if he's still, or she is still digging around in there and I've got to take a breath, I like tap on the shoulder says, Hey, let's bag him up for a minute. Okay. So that's kind of the thought process on that, but you don't want to hold the clamp too long because you can also build that pressure up on the inside. All right, so intermittent bubbling is okay. Continuous bubbling is a bad sign. That's when you need to check for a leak. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, I'm gonna go get my clamps and I'm going to start at the patient. And about every two inches, I'm gonna put the clamps on and look at the water seal. If the bubbling stops, that tells me that that hole or that leak is just between the clamps and the patient. I'm gonna tape that area and go recheck it. Um, and if the bubbling ne never stops and I get all the way down to the drain, that means there's a problem with the drainage unit, okay? The other reason to start at the patient is because this is the most common place for a leak. That dressing needs to be reinforced, it needs to be resecured or something like that. So if that's the most likely place, why not start there, right? All right, the last one, I'm gonna show you one more thing here. This is not in your book. Um, if you wanna screenshot this or whatever, this is like the esophageal detection device. I've seen this on the exam a couple times. And again, the same reason for taking the time to talk about it. If you see, oh, combi tube, it's an airway device. I should know more about this. It's gotta be the right answer. Even though the right answer is staring me in the face and it's another answer, all right? So the question has been about which port do you ventilate through? 
The easy answer, I'm gonna cut right to the chase. The easy answer is whichever port makes the chest go up and down gives you lung sounds and no epigastric sounds. Because this is, this is why it's a mind blow is because like what? It's got two tubes. It's got two, every other airway has one, all right? So looking at how and why it works explains about the two tubes. It's got, it's a dual lumen, meaning there's two lumens through here, all right? And this is just placed blindly. The, the paramedic just puts it down the back of the throat. They, they insert it to this line here and inflate both balloons. The placement is random. There's a likely chance it goes in the esophagus. There's a, or there's a likely chance it goes into the trachea. Okay, either one. If there's no predictability, but that doesn't matter. It's going to work either way. All right. So they put the tube down. They inflate the cuffs. They'll start with tube one. Put your Ambu bag on it. Give some breaths. All right. The air from tube one comes out these side holes. Okay. Nothing comes out the tip from tube one. And if they're in the esophagus, that's what we want because the air will come out here and it will go up and over into the trachea. You're basically obstructing the esophagus to force the air this way. All right. Now, if tube one does not make the chest go up and down, give you lung sounds and absence of epigastric sounds, the medic goes to tube number two. Okay. So in this case, if it was placed in the trachea, then I do want the air coming out the distal tip here. And the lungs will go up and down, chest rise and fall, lung sounds, and no gastric sounds. And in this case, I would not want to use tube one because that would push the air out the side down the esophagus, right? So that's how that works. Um, it's the only one that's a dual lumen, so now you know. So, you know, the, the even easier answer is whichever tube the paramedics are using. But what do we always do when we receive an EMS patient? We recheck everything. Just like if you take a person to ICU, that ICU nurse is rechecking your lines, they're flushing them, make sure they're patent, they're rechecking any dressings you've done, any interventions. We always recheck EMS's work to make, because are there some EMS people that do stuff wrong? Yeah, we're all humans, okay? There, we're, there's all some opportunities for failures. All right. All right. So that was, and oh, I will come back to this, try and make up a little ground today. It's just a little video to break up some time here. Let me make a note and see what we're gonna do next here. Because we do need to use a few minutes. Nope, we are gonna take a break because the next up I wanna do is the blood gases. And it really does no good to talk about them for 10 minutes because it's a shorter section anyways. Uh, but it is about 40 minutes, which is too long to do all at one setting. So let's knock out a break here right quick. So during this break, um, in your handouts, that I mean, you can put the book away for the blood gases. They're not in the book. They're one of the separate handouts I sent you. It's the three-page stapled handout. If you got one of the black folders I mailed you, it's on the right-hand side towards the back. You can pull that and the practice problems out also, because that's what we'll be using, and slide the book to the side. Um, those of you guys that didn't get your books or materials yet, uh, the ABG is, uh, please let me know if you did, if I did send you the ABG handout, because you'll want to print that if possible during the break here. So I'm gonna hang out for a second. Those of you that did not get the book yet, please let me know, do I need to quickly send you the ABG handout? Let me know. Uh, for testing purposes, will it be worded reasonably? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so, the, and the king tube, the reason the, the king tube is a little bit different, the king tube is still a blind insertion. So, that's what it shares in common with the combi tube. But the king tube is only a single lumen airway. And the king tube is designed and tested and researched and validated that it will always go into the esophagus. On the king, it has the side ports. So the king reliably intubates the esophagus and the only port on the king pushes the air out and around it into the trachea. So that's why sometimes the king or whatever is messed up. So I'm looking to see if anybody tell, is telling me they need the ABG handouts tr file transferred to them immediately. And I'm not seeing it. So if you do, please let me know. I'm gonna hang out here for a minute before I go uh, hit the restroom and get some more coffee. Otherwise, you can start taking your break right now if you have your ABG stuff.
All right, so I'm not seeing anybody that needs 